Hey, my name is Matt and I'm glad that you took some time to check out this video because we create videos just like this one to help people just like you learn more about God and the life and the purpose that he has planned for you. And whether you are feeling distant from God right now, you've got questions about faith and spirituality, or you're trying to grow even closer to God, you'll find something here today that can help you. Today, we're beginning a new series called Unveiling Jesus, where we are looking at some of the startling truths that Jesus revealed about his identity. Truths that challenge and confront the assumptions that many of us hold about who Jesus really is. Because while most of us prefer a more comfortable, sanitized version of Jesus, he was pretty raw and straightforward about his identity. And in this series, we'll see how grasping this full picture of Jesus forces us to make a decision about the place that we'll give him in our lives. But understanding Jesus for who he really is will be the key to helping us navigate the challenges of our faith that we face and help us to follow him even better. If you surveyed everybody in your town and asked them whether or not they believed in God, what do you think that they would say? How many of them would say, I don't believe in any God at all? How many of them would say, I believe in the God of the Bible? And how many of them would be somewhere in the middle? Now, there was actually a survey that was done by a group called the Pew Research Group that asked that question. And I was surprised at the results because only 10% of the people in America said that they don't believe in any God at all. And 56% said that they believe in God as defined by the Bible. And 32% said that they don't believe in God, but they believe in some type of a deity or a higher power. And that was a much higher number than what I expected. But what they believe about the Bible was also surprising because while 56% of Americans said that they believe in God as defined by the Bible, only one in five believe that the Bible is actually the word of God. It's only 20%. So I don't know what to do that. Like 56% says, I believe in the God of the Bible. 20% said, and the Bible is true. <laughs> so I like there's, there's like a there's like a big gap there, right? And in Jesus' day, the people were kind of all over the place also. I mean, the evidence would say that all, most, if not all, Jewish people of Jesus' day believed in the existence of the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what they believed about God was, man, it was all, all over the place. Some of them believed in the resurrection uh, and that there was a literal heaven, and others believed that once you died, you died. They didn't believe in a resurrection at all. Like, it was like crazy. Some of them believed that God wanted us to work with the Romans since they're the ones in charge. Others of us thought, or others of them thought, uh, that the most godly thing that you could do would be to resist the Romans. Some believe that God was actively involved in their lives on a daily basis. Others believe that God had abandoned them. And the religious ruling elite had said, and the reason why God has abandoned us is because we're not keeping enough rules. And so they made up a whole lot more that aren't even in the Bible. They just said, let's give more checklists and more checklists. And maybe if we are all more and more and more and more and more and more holy, then maybe God would answer our prayers. Because the Hebrew Bible had said that God would send them a deliverer, and he hadn't. And now that the Romans are oppressing us the way they are, like, wouldn't this be a great time for the Messiah to show up? But it had been over 400 years since God had sent them a prophet. And it was unbelievably discouraging. Then Jesus shows up. And he claims to be the Messiah. But then the stuff he's saying doesn't line up with Moses saying to, to, to uh, Pharaoh, let my people go. And it doesn't match what David did when he raised up an army to overthrow the Philistines. Like Jesus isn't trying to set up an appointment with Herod or Caesar. And the guys he's recruiting are fishermen and tax collectors. Like, what are we going to do against the Roman soldiers with, with this crew? And they don't really like all the stuff that he says. Because he's talking about the sin that's in them and they're more concerned with the sin that's around them, and it's incredibly frustrating for them. Even John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, the one who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, who heard the audible voice of God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, the one who saw the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove, the one who had concrete proof that there's a God and that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God, gets to the place where he's beginning to have his doubts. In Matthew chapter 11, verse two through six, it says this, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing, so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? 
Why is he asking that? Because he's in prison. Like, <laughs> I'm sure he's thinking, if I'm the forebearer, the forerunner, right, for the Messiah, and you're the Messiah, who's supposed to establish the throne of your father David forever, who's going to be the rescuer like Moses was the rescuer, then what the heck am I doing in prison? Because this isn't really working out for me. So are you the guy or not? Because you're not doing what I think you ought to be doing. Jesus' response was this. Go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And tell him, God blesses those who do not run, uh, turn away because of me. So if Jesus is the Messiah, shouldn't all of my dreams come true? And for the answer, the answer for John is obviously no. And Jesus ends with, and God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. Literally, I wouldn't look this up in the Greek. Like, what was the actual words that Jesus said in Greek, translated word for word into English? And here's what Jesus said. God blesses the ones who do not take offense at me. Why would Jesus say this to John after his question? Because Jesus wasn't doing what John expected. And I think the same thing is true for us. Some of us struggle in our relationship with God because Jesus doesn't do what we want him to do. When did you first notice that? Maybe it was when you were in middle school and your grandparents uh, got sick and died. And you begged God to heal them. Or... Maybe you had a, a pet run away and you prayed for God to bring the pet back and God didn't bring the pet back. Or that your marriage, oh man, I just jumped into the deep end on that one, didn't I? That your marriage would stay together or that your kids would come back to you. Like it's, it's not that we're just now noticing that God doesn't always do what we tell him to do. It's just that the stakes are higher the older we get. I think that's what it is. Well, John's in prison. Are you the Messiah or not? Yes, I am. How do I know? Look at all the stuff that I've already done. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, Peter says that Jesus' miracles were to confirm that he was who he said he was, the Messiah, God in the flesh. The problem was that people thought the point of the Messiah was the miracles. So often Jesus would say, to the Jewish people that he would heal, don't tell anybody that I've healed you. Why? Because I don't want the miracles to be the thing. The miracles aren't the reason why I came. The miracles vouch for why I came. Why I came, he talked about in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From then on, it says, Jesus began to uh, preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's not the message they wanted from the Messiah. I mean, truthfully, when it comes to us and our relationship with God, that's not the message I want to hear either. Like, I want God to fix my marriage. And by fix my marriage, I want God to fix her. <laughs> when I want God to fix my finances, I want God to help the IRS forget I exist. Or for the credit card company to lose my documentation, my paperwork. That's what I want. I don't want God to work on the greed in me that keeps me overspending what I make. I don't want God to work in me to change how selfish my expectations are of my wife sometimes, right? Like God's always been more interested in addressing the sin in me than the sin around me. And that's always frustrated me. But it's always frustrated people about Jesus. But that's why he came. I mean, the thing that frustrated Jesus in the very next chapter, in Matthew chapter 12, is that they shout at Jesus, Show us a sign to prove that you have authority from God. And my thought is, what do you mean show you a sign? Like all of the miracles he's already doing? Because it seems like no matter what he did for them, they always wanted what? More. And I see myself in that part of the story too. No matter what God's done for me, if you look at the things I pray about, it seems like I'm always asking God, to just give me a little bit more. And the clarification between our expectations and Jesus's intention are spelled out real clear 
in something he said at the end of Matthew chapter 11. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 20. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles. Why? Because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. That was the whole point. Verse 21. What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. I tell you, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. That, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty tough. Jesus as judge. Then he keeps talking. He says, and you people of Capernaum, Will you be honored in heaven? No, you will go down to the place of the dead. For if the miracles I did for you had been done in wicked Sodom, it would still be here today. I tell you, even Sodom will be better off on judgment day than you. Now, the idea of, most of us have when we think of Jesus is Jesus welcoming the little children to come up close in the crowds so that they can learn from him too. Or we think of Jesus healing the blind man, or reaching out and touching the leper. What we forget is that Jesus is both shepherd and judge. And here we have three towns that Jesus is condemning, like he's done with them. They had experienced God's blessings. They had not repented of their sin, nor had they rearranged their lives around God's agenda. And so Jesus was done with them. And it wasn't what they had done, it's what they hadn't done. And I think some of us are in the same place. We say, what have I done? Like Tyre and Sidon could say, what have we done? Not Tyre and Sidon, but Seda and Chorazin. They, they could say, what did we do? Like you did all of these miracles here. We had faith and we trusted, we believed in you, and we listened to all the things that you said. And Jesus' concern was not that they weren't, it, it wasn't that they had done bad things. They hadn't done the right thing, which was repent of their sin, turn to God, and rearrange their lives around God's agenda. And Jesus breaks down the idea of the difference between those who are in right relationship with him and those who aren't based on what they do with their sin, how they receive what Jesus says in a series of stories over the next two chapters. We're going to read two of them, and I'll briefly mention three. Actually, I'm just going to explain the first one, but I'll read Jesus' explanation of it. The first story that Jesus says, he says, listen, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Remember, he had just pronounced judgment. Um, and he goes, here's, here's how, here's God's perspective of life. There's a farmer, and the farmer has a bag of seed, and he's scattering the seed like this. And he says, some of the seed falls on the, the walking path. And um, it's, it's hard dirt, and the birds come down and they eat the seed. Other seed falls on the side of the path where the rocks are. And so instantly it'll germinate, like a little bit of a shoot comes up, but the moment the sun comes out, the plant withers up because it didn't have a chance, it, it didn't have any roots. He says, but then some gets over here where the weeds are. It's, it's not on the path. It's not on the rocky side of the path. It's, it's in the weeds in between the path and the field. And it'll take root and it'll shoot up, but it doesn't produce any fruit because it's choked out by all the weeds. But then there's a fourth type of soil that the seed gets into and it's well prepared and it's, it's weeded and the roots go deep. And the seed produces some 60-fold, 80-fold, and 100-fold. That's the end of the sermon. The, the disciples asked Jesus a little bit later, what did you mean by that? And Jesus unpacks the, that, par that story this way. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 to 23, now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. And that's a certain percentage of even those of us who are here part of this service today. We've heard and it just never clicked for us. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. And this is some of us also. We receive it, we love it, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long, they fall away 
as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word because God doesn't do what I want. I heard another preacher one time say these are the people who try on Christianity in an experimental fashion to see if it makes them look better or feel more comfortable. But the moment that the jacket gets itchy, they, they take it off and discard it because it never became a part of who they are. Verse 22, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out, listen to this, is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, the pursuit of materialism. So no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Right after this, right after he tells us, he goes straight into another story. And this story is also about a farmer who has a field. And it's called the, the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds. What happens is, is that the farmer and his crew, they plant this huge wheat field. And as soon as it's planted and they finally finish, an enemy comes in during the night and scatters weeds throughout the entire harvest to mess with the owner of the field. Then the, the workers come to the owner and say, do you want us to go through the wheat field and pull up all of the weeds? And he says, no, because you might accidentally pull up one of the wheat. Tell you what, we'll wait until the end when it's harvested and at the threshing floor, we'll be able to separate the wheat from the chaff. And you might've heard that phrase before and this is where it comes from. Then Jesus also unpacks what this story means to his disciples later on in Matthew chapter 13, verse 29 and 30. He said, no, uh, he replied, here's what you'll do. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. So let them both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, lie them uh, tie them into bundles and burn them and uh, to put the wheat in the barn. The explanation is a few verses later when he says, uh, the son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the word world and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the harvesters are the angels. And just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a description of hell. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom and anyone with ears to hear, ears to hear, uh, should listen and understand. And the point for both stories is very similar. In the first story, the seed is the same but the reception of the soil is different. And in the second story, the field is the same, but the nature of the plant and its ultimate destination are different. And at the end of these two parables, Jesus gives us three really short ones. The first is the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, he said. Now, mustard seed is the size of a peppercorn. It's about this big. And I did the Google research on it. And a mustard seed plant in the right climate can grow to 30 feet tall. They're like it's the size of a pepper. And it can grow three stories high. That's how big this tree can get. Like that's, that's crazy that all of this comes from this. And he says that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. So the kingdom of heaven is like this seed that if it really is planted on the inside, if you let it get into the middle of who you are, it, it starts small, but it grows into this larger than life thing that takes over the entire landscape. He moves right from that one into the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. It's like yeast in dough. And a woman who puts just a little bit of leaven in the dough, a little bit of yeast in the dough, it spreads throughout every part of the dough when it's cooked. And he says, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. He said, those who allow that seed in, the good soil, the wheat, are the ones who, when they get a taste of it, not only does it take over the entire landscape, there's not a single part of your entire life that isn't affected by it, like the yeast in the dough. Those who are genuine followers of Jesus, those who've been reconciled to God, are not part-time 
Christians, according to Jesus. Those are the ones who are trying it on temporarily, at worst, or at best, are the ones who have no spiritual fruit in their life because it doesn't really matter to them. The more interested in the worries of this life or the pursuit of more stuff. But those who are in right relationship with God, those whose life is spiritually productive, are like the mustard seed. It's like yeast in the lump of dough, and it affects every other area of your life. And then the third story that he gives in quick succession, he says the kingdom of heaven is like a, a, a treasure buried in a field. Now it's an abandoned field and it has an owner, but the owner doesn't care about it. And this person finds this treasure buried in the field and he reburies it like it was and he finds out who the owner is and he can't afford it with his available cash. So what he does is he sells everything he owns in order to buy this field because of the treasure in it. Jesus says, that's what I meant when I said they repent of sin and turn to God because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They're the ones who the small becomes large. It affects every area of their life. And they would sell everything, everything that has ever meant anything, if that's what it took to have God and nothing else. And there's a few common threads in all five of these stories. The first is this. Not everybody is a child of God. And that's a hard truth. You and I have heard people say, well, everybody's a child of God. The only problem is Jesus didn't say that. He said there will definitely be people who are bundled up and cast into a, an actual burning hell for all of eternity. And it's, it's not a popular teaching, but that doesn't make it untrue. Jesus said the stakes are high for what we do in our heart and our relationship with God. And not everybody will be with God. There's another passage of scripture, I believe it's in Matthew chapter 16. I'm not 100% sure because I didn't look it up for the teaching. It just now popped into my head. And Jesus said, narrow is the gate and narrow is the path that leads to everlasting life because of the few people who take it. He said, wide is the path and wide is the gate that leads to hell because of the number of people who are on it. So according to Jesus, man, listen, like this is, this is the part of Jesus we'd rather leave packed up, right? It's the uncomfortable part of God. But he said, when it comes to the sea of humanity, the number of people who are reconciled to God by faith in Jesus is small in comparison to those who are not. Yeah, that's a hard truth. Next, the condition of the heart determines what happens to the seed. See, it's not God who goes, I want you guys to go that way. And I love these people more. That's why they get to be with me. No, the parable of the farmer with the sower, the seed, the soil, tells us that the seed is the same. Like right now in this service, there's probably all four different types of soil. And I'm saying the same thing to everybody who's a part of this service. And some who are part of this service, you've already checked out. Like you're not listening at all and you can't wait till I shut up and I'm not offended by that. I've been in church services like that too. I hope that isn't the way everybody feels about today's teaching, but some of you, no doubt, that's how you feel. Others of you, you're like, all right, I'm gonna try this on. Like you're not gonna jump into the deep end, but you're gonna put your foot in the shallow end. And if it's too cold, you'll take your foot out. That's the wide path. Uh, but there are, there are others that just, just stink, and, stink and jump in, right? Those are the ones who are all about it. But the, the seed is the same. The only difference is whether or not your heart is hardened to the things of God or softened to the things of God. So I'm gonna jump ahead real quick and say that if your heart is softened towards the thing of God, then you need to do what Jesus said. And let's get to the place where you transfer your trust off of your church, off of 
your goodness off of anything else and accept that only Jesus' goodness is good enough to make you right with God, that only Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection pays off your debt before a holy and righteous God, and that Jesus does have the authority and the ability to determine whether or not you truly love God above everything else. And if not, I can't fix that for you, but you can. The next thought from these stories is that my job personally isn't to determine who is and who isn't a weed. My job isn't to separate the wheat from the weeds, to determine this person is a Christian, this person is not a Christian, this person is right with God, this person is not right with God. I can say what the Bible has to say about what it means to be right with God or to be far from God, but I'm not the judge to determine who is and who isn't. However, I do get to make that determination about myself. I can evaluate my own heart to determine whether or not I'm in right relationship with God. A third question I would ask is how big that mustard seed has grown. Some of us, we turn from sin and begin following Jesus, but if we're going to be honest, this plant is not thriving. We would not say that it is this gigantic 30-foot tall mustard tree. I mean, at one point, it was maybe this, or it just hasn't been cultivated, and so we've allowed the cares of this life to come in and choke us out, and our relationship with God is an added thing to our life. It's not the central part of our life. It's not the thing around which every other part of our life has been affected and rearranged. It's just an extra thing. And that leads me to the question, has the leaven affected every part of the dough? Is there any part of your life that you've said is off limits to God? Maybe it's your sexuality. Maybe it's what you do with your money. Maybe it's how you treat your spouse or whether or not you respect and honor your parents or whether or not you serve others at work or forgive people that hurt you in your past. Like what parts of your life have you said are still off limits to God? And have you been willing to sell the farm in order to buy that field? And I'm not your judge. And I love what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 17. It's right after John 3, 16, which is probably the most famous verse in the Bible. It says, uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The next verse says this. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to rescue the world through him. Now get this. This does not mean that Jesus isn't going to judge he just said, I didn't come here to judge. I came here to rescue. Verse 18 says there is judgment coming. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. That's the Son of God. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. So I'm wrapping it up and I'm asking you to do a personal inventory. Corazon, Bethsaida, in Capernaum, were not judged because they were worse than everybody else. They were judged because they did not do what Jesus called them to do, which was repent of their sin, turn to God, and rearrange their life around God's kingdom purposes. And that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking if you're a good and decent person. You're part of a church service on a weekend. You're probably a decent person. That's not the question. I'm asking, not even if you believe in God, but have you ever transferred your trust off of your own goodness or any other box you've ever checked and placed the only check mark that matters? Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to pay for my sin, and I receive that. God, forgive me for sinning against you and others. Forgive me for transgressing my own conscience. Help me to follow you with the rest of my life. That's what Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum would not do. They wanted all the benefits of being close to God, but they didn't want God to change anything on the inside. But that was the whole purpose for which he came. So I'm asking if you've ever allowed God to do that in you either. And where are you in the story of the farmer? Are you like the footpath where everything that I'm saying is going in one ear and out the other? Or... Are you in a place where you've tried on Christianity in experimental fashion, but once it got inconvenient or difficult or didn't make things better, 
you kind of took it off again and you're still distant from God, but you're thinking about it. Or maybe you have checked that box. I've turned from sin to begin following Jesus. I've placed my faith and trust in what he did for me to make me right with God. But truthfully, the mustard tree is struggling because you've allowed a whole lot of other crap to come into your life that doesn't belong there any longer. Or are you that fourth category where it is actually producing a crop of godliness and good because that seed is planted deep and it's the one thing you care most about and you're letting it affect every other part of your entire life as you grow in your relationship with Jesus. I don't know where you're at in this story, but I hope you do. Let's pray. God, I love you with all of my heart. And I'm thankful that you care about us enough to warn us about the consequences of only being interested in the benefits of proximity to you rather than in the transformation that you're interested in doing on the inside of us. And that happens through repentance. God, I am distracted by all the brokenness around me, but I think you care more about the brokenness that's in me. The brokenness that's in me as it relates to my marriage, my relationship with my kids, my neighbors, my coworkers, the way that I resolve myself to my past, what I do with my money, how I treat other people who treat me poorly. God, all of this matters. And it's not that you don't care what's happening in them, but as it relates to me and what I should be focused on, it's not them, but it's, it's me. So help me to recognize that the kingdom of heaven coming is less about me getting all of my dreams come true than it is about me being reconciled to you through the repentance that reconciles me to you from all the sins that I've committed, the darkness that's on the inside of me. God, save me from the sin that is in me. Help me to be the man you created me to be. Point out all of the weeds that are choking out what you want to do in my life. Point out the area of your life that you struggle with that's holding you back spiritually and hand that to God also. God, I love you with all of my heart. I'm thankful that you love us more. Forgive us and help us to keep growing in our relationship with you. Help our lives to be productive, 30-fold, 60-fold, and even 100-fold. Dear God, make our lives count. We ask this in Jesus' name, and we all say it together, amen. Hey, I really hope that you found this teaching to be helpful no matter where you are at in your faith. And as we go through this series and discover more about Jesus' identity, I hope that you'll be challenged to confront your own personal assumptions of Him so that your new understanding of Jesus will create new areas of growth for your personal faith. And if there's any way that I or our church can be of help to you in your journey of life or faith, we'd be happy to play a part in that. In fact, you can reach out to us to connect for prayer, encouragement or ask a question that you have by using the info that you see on your screen right now or maybe you'd like other resources to help you continue growing in your faith we can help with that too right now our church is actually going through a weekly bible reading plan together that sets us up for the message that you'll hear next week and helps you establish a daily rhythm of bible reading so if you want to join this with us you can just text the word bible to the number that you see on your screen we really do want to help you grow however we can so just let us know that's it for this week. We'll see you again next time.